from my colleague at City University. Hello, Catherine. Hello. I was just finding the recording button there, so we may have missed the first couple of seconds, but uh, never mind. Oh, we're recording now, are we? Okay. We are recording Excellent. now. So Excellent. So 71 webinars and I've just about got the hang of how to do everything. Um, I'm not entirely flying solo. So Catherine, thank you for stepping in to help. Um, you may have noticed that Chris is not with us today. Um, we're hoping he's going to be back in November. Uh, more about that soon, but really delighted to have star of BBC's Only Connect, the uh, the best quiz show, Catherine Drum here. So we're looking for lots of amusing anecdotes and quips from you, Catherine. <laughs> oh, well, I'm mainly going to try and sit here and look pretty and put links into the chat. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that's that's perfect as well. OK, well, we've got an exciting uh, webinar lined up um, today. So we're going to go through um, a bit about some what's been happening since we last met, which has been quite a long time. So the last webinar was actually, I believe, at the end of May when we talked about open access monographs. Um, so I've got some copyright news, a little bit of news for you. Um, and then the, the main event of today is we're going to hear about the work of the Libraries and Archives Copyright Alliance with from uh, Matt Lambert and Christy Henshaw, who are going to be joining us. They're here already. They're, uh, they're ready just off camera um, to, to join us. Um, and then say a bit more about what's coming up next. So um, let's let's get going. So what's been happening since we last met? Well, I know you all like some news and not just copyright news. So um, I wanted to just let you know um, that I, I've got some new additions to my family, my cat family. So since we last met, um, I sadly lost my cat Pickle and um, I am a bit obsessed with tortoiseshell cats and I gave it a couple of months and just a few days ago um, I have got uh, Lyra who is the cat on the right, the big mummy cat and then I've got Padmini or Minnie as I'm calling her um, who's the little one sitting on my Mac so um, and they are shut out of this room and not joining this webinar until they learn how to behave but they're very cute and they're causing lots of chaos so you you want to comment on um yes no it's very very sad about very sad about pickle so but no cats on camera catherine no cats on camera is that the agreement <laughs> well i i was trying to persuade you to, for them to make a guest appearance but uh, <laughs> you you were dead against it but maybe maybe we'll manage to persuade you when minnie's calmed down a bit yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she's 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 kind of going. Well, she may be having a sleep at the moment, hopefully. So, yes. OK, let's uh, since we last met as well, just also to let you know. So this was a picture took uh, those of you who were at Ice Pops, which I'll say more about in a moment, know that Chris has been on extended leave and is is uh, going to be away now um, until November. He will be back. He sends his best wishes to everybody but just to say we're really thinking of him he's been going through a really difficult time so he's he's not joining us um at this month's webinar but let's hope we're back ready before the end of the year um so yeah um okay and anyone who is looking for recordings of previous webinars uh, just a reminder i think you're going to pop some uh, links in the chats for me aren't you catherine um, but most people know that we maintain an archive um, with all the slides and all the recordings going back to March 2020 um, from this webinar series. Um, and they're also hosted on the Alt YouTube channel as well. Um, so which is where this recording is um, going to end up too. So that's that's the webinar and blog archive. Now it is time in a seamless way for what they call okay it's copyright news so uh what's been going on in the world of copyright well quite a lot of things um and as we haven't had a webinar since um the end of may um i i thought that there's just a couple of things i was going to pick out today otherwise we could be doing copyright news um, probably till the end of uh, the the afternoon. But a couple of things to pick up. So firstly, just to say um, that last month in 
September at the Leeds Beckett University. We held the Ice Pops Conference, um, a fantastic conference. Here I am with uh, Kyle Courtney, who was our keynote speaker. And just to let people know that there are resources available um, on the website. I've been putting presentations up um, from our lightning talk speakers, from people who participated in the World Cafe. And I am chasing Kyle for his slides. Uh, I know lots of people will want them and they will go on the website soon. Um, but um, he gave us a great talk um, about uh, some of the work that he's been doing um, around the sort of uh, advocating for, for libraries and looking at issues related to fair use. And he obviously talked a bit about the, the Internet Archive case as well. Um, I'll say more about that in a moment, um, but yeah, it was a, a, a good conference. I'm really lovely to see many of you there who obviously are regulars at these webinars as well. Really nice to catch up with you all and hope you all had a great time. The evaluation looks very positive. So um, another just bit of news um, since we last met. So um, if you haven't had a chance to have a listen to the Copyright Waffle podcast that Chris and I run, um, then um, this one is one that you really won't want to miss because who doesn't love a bit of copyright and ABBA? So check out um, the, the most recent podcast that we did, um, which was actually recorded a little while ago, um, but with um, Kyle Magnus Palm, who is the ABBA biographer. Um, he was actually on quite a number of um, TV programmes to cel celebrate the 50 years of ABBA win winning the Eurovision Song Contest. He's been documenting um, their work. He's had written numerous books, but he particularly picks up issues around um, copyright, around sampling of ABBA's work. And um, yeah, it's a fantastic uh, podcast and really good. Um, also really interesting just to note that when I uploaded this one onto SoundCloud, um, actually when it went, because it also goes onto Spotify, we got a copyright takedown notice um, because they said that they have detected third party um, uh, content in there. And we played a really short clip of uh, ABBA's Dancing Queen and we were looking at kind of tunes that like music that sampled from Dancing Queen and um, they said they were going to take it down for copyright infringement so I thought that was quite an interesting um, experience to go through and I filled in their form and I said it was being used under an exception for criticism and review and it is still there so there we go exceptions exceptions are uh do work are you you know i i i wasn't sure what was going to happen in this process i wasn't sure if someone on spotify was making a judgment whether an ai was making a judgment initially so very interesting process next up um <clears throat> is the news that actually came out literally um the day before the ice pops conference so people who were there um will know more um about this but i'm sure you haven't if you're anyone in the kind of copyright world you haven't missed um, the news around the Internet Archive losing their appeal. Um, so this is, is the case um, that was brought about by a number of publishers um, who claimed that the National Emergency Library um, was um, infringing copyright with uh, particular titles that they shared during the pandemic. Um, so it is only about a very specific set of titles and um, there's lots and lots um, about this. There's been some concerns that, uh, that the judgment that sort of came about might mean the end of controlled digital lending. Anyone who's at Ice Pops, Kyle was very clear that the judgment was a very particular um, circuit court that only, so it only applies in quite a small jurisdiction um, in, in the United States. So it's not all across all the states and also um, it was a particular type of controlled or, or uncontrolled digital lending that they were judging of not to be fair use, not the controlled digital lending that many universities in the US do. So, but lots of interesting discussions. It's also been in Publishers Weekly. I could have put lots and lots of links in to other stories. And obviously it's really, you know, it's good to read um, about this case and to read up on the different perspectives because you'll see it, it presented, you know, I've, I've 
put the link into the Internet Archive blog, which is obviously going to be one side of the story. Um, and do have a have a, a, a read up on this further. Um, I wanted to highlight um, a webinar that's already taken place. Um, I know quite a number of people probably joined, but if you didn't, um, there is actually from the, the link we've just popped into the chat, you can get access to a recording. So um, Ben White was um, one of the main presenters talking at this IFL webinar, which was about libraries, copyright and AI for science and research. We've been getting lots and lots of discussions about AI um, on this copy seek. Um, it's obviously a topic that lots of uh, people are, are grappling with at the moment. So I'm sure it's going to be a topic we'll return to in the webinars um, that we run here. Um, so, but just wanted to flag up that this is a really good recording and worth having a listen to. Um, because it talks about how um, it works in different jurisdictions. UK is mentioned, but a number of other countries um, and looking at some of the sort of litigation concerning um, AI or machine learning. So which is obviously evolving all the time. Um, next up, I just wanted to mention, so um, many of you um, I'm sure will probably feel relatively uh, confident about copyright, but maybe you are still confused by copyright. And I wanted to flag up um, that there is going to be a new copyright course created by Learning On Screen that's available. Next week um, on Wednesday, they're running a webinar um, where you can find out a bit more about the course that they've created and you can sign up. So the webinar itself is free. The course is not, um, but I just, uh wanted to sort of flag that up i think lots of people are registering um just to hear a bit more about the course that they've put together um it says you know it is also aimed at people whether you're new to copyright or if you're looking to refresh your understanding and it's obviously being from learning on screen there is a particular focus on audio visual material which i know lots of us often think oh that's a bit more tricky so just one for your diaries for next week um, and I think that is it for all our, our copyright news. So um, I am now going to um, introduce our speakers, I think, for the main event of um, today's webinar. So um, this webinar has been some time in the planning, um, but really delighted to have the co-chairs of uh, LACA, which is the Libraries and Archives Copyright Alliance. So we have Christy Henshaw, who is at the Welcome Collection, where she's head of digital production. And we have Matt Lambert, who's head of copyright policy and assurance at the British Library. Um, so really, really pleased as well that you're both, um, you took over chair, co-chairing um, LACA, which I think about a year ago I, I left. I've been a member of LACA for a really long time and it was not anything related to you two. So Christy, I think you've actually been co-chair for some time as well, haven't you? So, but um, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to hand over to you both. You've actually you've prepared a slide as well. So let's let's just pop your slide up um, as well, which is just, I think, a, a, a close up of the uh, the LACA logo. And um, it's got your emails on. So, Christy, Matt, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I I'm expecting you to talk for around 20 minutes or so, but there'll be plenty of time for questions, hopefully. Okay. Can we hear you? Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yes. great. Thank you so much. Um, so I think we're going to keep the slide up for a, a couple of minutes and then we're going to take it down so that you guys can see us. Is that right? And then yeah, we'll just give me a chat when you want me to take it down. I can do that. Yep, yeah. absolutely. Just give people a chance. They can note your emails, etc. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, okay, should I should I get started, Matt? I was just yeah. going to see what we're going to do. So um, I'm Christy, and um, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm, you will see me um, <laughs> if, you, if you're looking at me on the screen, but just in the interest of accessibility, I'm a um, white woman with um, medium long blonde hair, and I'm wearing a yellow jumper because it is a bit cold this morning. Um, so Matt and I are going to give you um, a bit of an overview of LACA. Some of you, probably quite a few of you do know about us. I hope you know about us. Um, but um, seeing as we're coming up to our 35th anniversary or 
we are in this is our 35th year um it's kind of a nice a nice time just so happens it's a a nice year for us to be kind of reminding people what we do or introducing us um to people who who maybe never uh heard of us before so i'm gonna tell you just a little bit about who we are and matt is going to talk about um what our key focus is at the moment the kinds of things that that we're interested in and that we are mm -hmm. representing our members around um and discussing um I'm going to talk a little bit about what that actually looks like in practice. Um, and then Matt's going to talk about kind of what we see coming up for um, our group in the future. So hopefully that all sounds um, inter interesting. <laughs> um, oh, we're on now, I think. I don't know. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yes, I'm not you're on. Just to let you know, you're on now. <laughs> yeah, you're on. <laughs> OK, so people can see me. Yes, that's it. They can see you. Yeah. Um, does that sound okay, Matt? Anything to add yep. before I get started? No, that's, that's, that sounds great. <laughs> okay, um, as Jane said, I'll, I'll let Matt introduce himself, but as Jane said, I'm, a, I'm one of the co-chairs of LACA. I've been a co-chair of LACA now for about four years, so um, I was, well, I was vice chair and then co-chair, um, and I've been on the LACA committee for about, oh gosh, I don't even know, eight years or something like that. Um, so I've been kind of in and around LACA for a while now. Um, and yeah, Matt and I are actually coming up to the end of our second year, which is our first term as co-chairs together. Um, so the Library and Archives Copyright Alliance um, is a group that's working towards fair copyright that's fit for purpose for our members. And I will talk a little bit about who our members are. As I said, it's been going for about 35 years. I, I'm not familiar with the earlier years, <laughs> um, but I am familiar with the more recent years. Um, and yeah, we're just really excited to be able to talk to you all about what we do um, and how we advocate for your rights. So the members that we have, just to give you a sense of kind of the, the areas that we represent, we've got members from organizations like the Archives and Records Association, Art Lar Library Society, um, Central for the Regulation of the Creative Economy, or CREATE as you might know it, um, International Association of Music Libraries, and other kind of similar groups that are representing certain sort of sectors, I guess, of, of the library and archives uh, world. We've got people representing individual organizations like me, representing Welcome Collection, um, uh, your own Chris Morrison, who is now at Oxford, who represents Bodleian as well as other things, um, and uh, BFI, for example. Um, and the national libraries are represented, so British Library, uh, National Library of Scotland, National Library of Wales, and the National Archives as well. Um, and NHS Scotland and um, Health Education England and um, Research Libraries UK. And that's not an exhaustive list, but hopefully it gives you a sense of the kinds of organizations that are involved in this committee and lending their support and their um, expertise. And we also have individual members who are in and of themselves sort of copyright experts who aren't necessarily representing specific organizations, institutions, or associations or anything like that, but are providing some really um, important advice and expertise to the group. Um, and just to say that the committee, as you know, we've got two co-chairs. Those are our only officer roles at the moment. We hold hybrid meetings every two or three months, and we swap between our two organizations. So welcome and the British Library, both of us being on the Eastern Road, about a 10 minute walk from each other. <laughs> Um, and then we do have extra meetings depending on you know what's going on and, and what we're working on together um, and we hold elections every couple of years so that just gives you a little flavor of the of who we are the organization the structure that we are um, and I'm going to hand over to Matt who can talk to you about the actual meat of what we're what we're doing and what we're looking at over to you Matt thanks Thanks, Christy. Um, so uh, advocacy, um, I mean, it's, it's quite a sort of fluffy word, isn't it? And, and what does that mean that we really do? Well, um, just to give you a kind of flavor, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the current things that we've been we've been up to recently. Um, so we've been involved in the IPO's discussions around TDM and AI. We uh, coordinated responses to the consultation. Then we were involved in the policy discussions that followed all of that. Um, and two of our members were a part of the IPO's working group on IP and AI. 
Um, that's gone a little bit quiet at the moment, but we're continuing to follow up on this and make sure that our sector is not forgotten about. Um, We've been involved in pushing back on publisher AI clauses and content agreements, so working with JISC and other academic bodies to ensure that the sector's pushing back in a consistent and even manner. Um, we're involved in, in a SILIP and KR21-led project looking at ebooks um, with a goal of making the availability and pricing a lot fairer. Um, and I know that's something that will be um, close to a lot of people's hearts because it's uh, not in a very good place at the moment. Um, and we're also involved in a project to include public libraries in the definition of educational institutions um, within the Copyright Designs and Patents Act. And while that sounds like quite a small thing, potentially it could open up the possibility of making um, broadcast material that's been recorded uh, and, and available under ERA licenses available in public libraries. So imagine the kind of box of broadcasts and the BFI uh, content available in every single public library in the country. So potentially making, making content a lot more widely available. So that's just a sort of flavor of the kind of things that we've been doing very recently. Um, more broadly, we've got a number of areas that we'd like to see uh, copyright reform in. These include flexible exceptions, so um, sort of open norms, as they're often referred to, bringing us our exceptions um, sort of more in line with the sort of US-style fair use. Um, we found a lot of problems during lockdown where our exceptions were so tightly constrained that actually they didn't really fit into those kind of situations. So providing a little more openness there I think would be would be really beneficial then the right to lend both physically and with the right controls digitally um, I think we'd all like um, a lot more of that um, the right to acquire content fairly so this is going back to to um, ebooks and digital content and, and how we um, how we include that in our collections the right to copy for research I think that's reasonably self-explanatory um, Ensuring statutory exceptions are protected. So, for example, making sure that um, the non-contract override clauses that we see in a lot of our exceptions remain and indeed that they're included in any future exceptions and any future reform that we see. Um, working to enable mass digitization. Um, is that something we do a lot of at the, at the British Library, but I know a lot of other libraries and archives do it as well. Um, and so we lost the, the orphan work exception as a part of Brexit. So we'd like to see something along those lines coming back and also bringing in something akin to the EU's DSM out of commerce exception. Um, some tools that really kind of enable us to, um, to make these, these kind of lockdown archives much more widely available. Um, we'd like to see an expansion of author rights retention and second, secondary publishing rights. Um, as I said, we're looking at redefining um, what an educational establishment is um, to open up some of the more educationally focused exceptions. And we'd like to see a bit of an expansion of the dedicated terminal exception, um, because we feel that could be quite useful for libraries and archives. And so that gives you an idea of the kind of... Um, focuses and, and things that we're looking at at the moment but um, by all means if you think we've missed anything or if there are any pressing points um, that are affecting any of your libraries please do get in touch and, and we can look at including them within our within our priorities um, and I'll hand back to Christy to talk a little bit about what our work looks like at the moment over to you okay uh, thanks Matt. Um, so yeah, so just to give you a sense of like what it means in practice to be involved in a group like this or um, to be doing this kind of work, I just wanted to give you a sense of some of the practical things that we can do. So, I mean, you know, at a minimum, we can respond to the relevant IPO consultations. So the Intellectual Property Office um, puts out requests for feedback and input into things through consultations. And so we can come together as the committee to respond to those on behalf of our members representing their views, or we can support our members in their um, individual institutional responses to these. And we do that on a fairly regular basis. Um, we can also, we have a relationship with people at the IPO, so we can um, schedule meetings with them on occasion. We can, we are, we tend to be invited, not 
maybe for every single thing, but we do get invited to um, stakeholder meetings, roundtables, and basically groups where they're trying to get input in from the sector um, and other departments, government departments as well, not just IPO. Um, and so we have new ministers coming in, which sometimes happens on a really kind of, you know, through the revolving door. <laughs> sometimes in the past few years, um, we will often try to get in touch with like relevant government um, departments to sort of let them know who we are and what we do. So that's all part of the lobbying effort, basically. Writing letters, of course, um, we write, might write letters where maybe there isn't a consultation or a meeting or an, another sort of opportunity for us to jump in um, to kind of uh, give them a sense of what our views are on certain things, such as um, providing feedback, um, lobbying around issues of interest to our members, for example, around AI and TDM. That's a big one at the moment because IPO had a recent consultation. They were looking at guidelines. They were looking at making some changes to TDM and so on. Um, uh, and we might talk about things like licensing considerations, um, you know, around the ebook market and things like that. So we can do that on behalf of our members. We also can support peer organizations lobbying efforts by the discussions that we have as a group and sort of raising awareness and sharing information and insights and um, signing joint letters with other organizations and lending our support. Um, and the involvement of the whole committee. So we're chairs, we, we're, we're the most active probably in terms of you know, making sure that the committee is, is focused and, and doing the things it needs to do. But the whole group is really important and all the members of the group and anyone in that group can be involved in these kinds of activities um, and making sure that their interests are represented, um, proactively providing input as well, providing expertise and helping with things like evidence gathering um, and, and raising awareness. Um, in their own organizations or sectors. So hopefully that is a little bit, it's still a little, probably a little bit vague, but um, hopefully it gives you a sense of the kinds of actual proactive and, and reactive things that, that we can do. Um, and I'm gonna hand back to Matt. Thanks, Christy. So um, just the last little bit um, and talking about looking towards the future. Um, so, I mean, well, in the immediate future, we'll be continuing with all the, the activities I mentioned earlier. Um, and so providing a, AI and, and TDM advice and expertise where it's needed and continuing to have discussions with the IPO and other stakeholders to ensure that libraries and archives are, are represented. We'll be working with the IPO and DCMS um, and another of number of other organizations, uh, BFI, BBC, BL, Libraries Connected, those kind of organizations, um, looking at the, the, the definition of educational institutions, as I talked about already. Um, we'll be forging closer relationships with like-minded organizations so that when, when there are issues like this, we can advocate with more weight and we can speak with a similar voice, um, give us more, more weight in those discussions. Um, we'll be developing other activities in the other priorities I mentioned earlier um, and really just just making sure that the library and archive sector is represented um, when the government is considering copyright reform and making sure that we're not forgotten about often in advocacy a, a, a lot of the kind of commercial organizations have a lot louder voice because they can spend money on lobbyists and that kind of thing and often the the kind of cultural heritage and library and archive sectors get left out of that because we're not as loud and as vocal so we're doing our best to make sure that that isn't the case and that our voice is heard and our needs are are catered for in the same way as all the other organizations and i think that's about it is there anything you wanted to add christy um no i was going to ask to have the slide back up so that you've got our emails because you know we really mm -hmm. encourage people to get in touch if there are things of particular interest to you that you think LACA should be aware of or any any other um, you know feedback you might have for us um, yeah that, I mean that's that's pretty much I think all we had to say in terms of our kind of presentation part of this um, so yeah I see one question but are there if there are any other questions I guess you can I yeah, no, I was going to, I've just popped your mm. slide up, but I'll, I'll, I'll take it down again and then maybe pop it back up again at the end if we, if we need it. Um, I, I had a, a, a couple of questions, um, but I've also said to people, yeah, to feel free to put things in the chat. 
Um, so I think, shall we go to Carol's question first, which is about yeah. whether there is a one stop shop for all things to do with providing accessible alternative materials for blind and partially sighted students. And she's fairly new to the area and finding that there are bits of information re relevant um, all over the place. I, I have to say, um, Carol, that um, one of the things that um, Chris and I have been working on is this the, the survey we did about copyright anxiety. But one of the things that comes out from that and other research we've done is that people say, particularly in the UK, it's quite hard to find the one place to go, you know, to sort of look for copyright information. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's, you know, it is a, a, a fact that there are different organisations and maybe some of those organisations, we could talk to each other about how to make that a bit easier for people, because I think it's probably causing more anxiety, just that sort of. And then when I look, I don't know where to look because, you know, obviously lots of people struggle with this organisation struggle, like the old cool sig doesn't give what might be construed as legal advice. We don't put up too much stuff. And, and lack of, you know, we've had similar discussions, haven't we, about, mm -hmm. you know, how far you can you you can put up information before it starts to look like you're you're kind of telling everyone what to do. Yeah. But then the problem is that there's lots and lots of other places to look, and so it becomes quite confusing for new people. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know if there is a place um, to answer um, Carol's question about uh, accessible alternative formats. Um, but do you, Ah, John Kelly's popped something in. That's very handy, John. Thank you. But yeah, Christy or, or Matt, did you want to respond to that one as well? Um, I mean, I don't know of a single central place which has all of this kind of stuff, but just to say that the, the accessibility exception within um, UK copyright law is very broad and is, is very open and, and very mm. good. So, you know, if you are aware of an organisation which has the content that you would like an accessible version of, there is an exception there that will allow them to make an accessible copy for you. Um, speaking for my organization, I know we make a lot of accessible copies at the British Library um, for requests. So um, you could always ask us, um, but I know, yeah. you know it's, uh, it's a very good exception. So if you are aware of the, the, the content in an organization that you want, by all means, get in touch with them. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got another question that's just appeared. But yeah, thank you, John, for sharing that. And John, John Kelly, if you do, if you want, if you wanted to come on, John, at all, and say anything more about the JISC um, accessibility community group, then please do feel free. But I know you've just popped a link into that. It seems like accessibility is a topic that might be worth us having another. A webinar about maybe early in the new year so i know there's been a lot of interest in that um Thank so you. yeah just yeah just hi just, john hello how are you Listen, yeah, yeah good, just, thanks yeah just to mention, yeah the community there's a lot of good stuff shared on that uh, group and you know a lot of uh, technical stuff as well you know, you know maths how to do maths properly accessibly and graphics okay. and all that sort of stuff so it is, it is there's a lot of resources there that but you do have to get in and get uh, become a member and see what's being shared. OK, OK, Carol, that sounds like one for you to check out and, and um, others as well, um, if you're interested. Yeah, thank you very much, John. And nice to hear from you. Cheers. Um, so, yeah, should we go to Debbie's question now, um, Matt, Christy? Um, so. It's, do you have any insight into why the AI copyright working group failed? Um, I think perhaps this is one for me to jump in on um, in yeah, that I no, sat no, on no, the yeah. uh, working group. Um, so and the working group was was very, very large. Um, there was a lot of representation from the creative industries, so the music, publishing, newspaper publishing, film, um, and a lot of representation from from other cultural heritage as well and AI is, is it's an enormously broad area you know it's it isn't just one one type of AI you know you have generative AI you have AI that that builds 
you know um, call waiting lists and and academic research and and all of these kind of things and really there isn't one solution to fit all and as you know the discussions went on it became more and more apparent that there wasn't one simple solution that could that could resolve everyone's concerns um, and at the same time the IPO were really pressing to have a kind of voluntary code of best practice um, and there are a lot of concerns around this in that you know why would AI firms volunteer kind of where they'd got the content from and potentially open themselves up to up to lawsuits um, and if they weren't going to to um, sort of be a part of that it didn't have any teeth so it sort of all started to fall apart when you know there was no no requirement to be a part of it and as the the, the kind of the needs of all the different parties became more apparent it just it became very clear that we really couldn't have voluntary best practice guidelines which would which would work and which would deal with everyone's concerns mm. it's actually it's quite a, a a common um kind of issue i think isn't it around <laughs> copyright issues my my question matt and christy was gonna be um and it is you know partly i've got some insight into this having to gone to meetings over the years um uh, at the ipo about you know the the work lobbying for, for 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 libraries and archives and for cultural heritage it you know how difficult do you think it is to actually get heard in in the voice of you know the industry and you know rights holders who have you know it, it feels often to me like an unfair advantage you know they mm -hmm. have they have a lot of they have a lot more power but they have a lot of kind of money behind them essentially don't mm -hmm. they yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we saw that definitely after the, the, the consultation around the TDM exception. Um, we were included in discussions and we did submit responses to the consultation, but, you know, we didn't have the same lobbying power that the creative industries did, for example. And they had, you know, dedicated lobbyists meeting with government officials regularly and they were, exert, they were able to exert a lot of kind of political pressure um, in their favour and, and you know a, a lot of us in, in LACA and in other cultural heritage advocacy groups we do this alongside our full-time jobs and so we don't have that same kind of weight and we can't bring that same kind of political power to bear um, and so we are included in discussions which is which is great but we it does sometimes feel like um, things are slightly stacked against us yeah yeah christy did you want to come in uh yeah i mean all of that i think um i mean the fact that we even have exceptions is part of a sort of general you know it was a part of a trend to try to make copyright more fair and i think um the voice of um you know look at libraries archives cultural heritage was you know important and i think where we're at now is we don't want to see the erosion of some of those rights i mean yes we would like to see even more but we also need to make sure that we're not sort of just going oh we have these exceptions now oh done dusted we don't need to worry about it anymore you know because we do need to be pushing back against these much more organized and well-funded and well-resourced sort of potential lobbying efforts and i think the ai or the tdm exception is one of those um where you know we are you know we do need to make sure that these things don't get eroded and we are able to continue using them in the spirit in which they were originally drafted um yeah 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 absolutely uh, yeah really i suppose that, that ties in with the the question i had which is you know we're talking about how do we manage to engage with these big institutions and you know big companies um and very much it's often that um, those of us with an interest in copyright are, feel like we're kind of lower down the feeding chain it, within our own institutions. So, you know, how do, how do we engage like the senior managers in our institutions <laughs> with understanding the importance of copyright and copyright exceptions, things like that? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, it's definitely a, a difficulty and, and one which we hope 
Lacquer as an organization is able to to help with because you know it does have senior people from across the sector representing academic libraries uh, national libraries archives and all of those organizations and together we do have more weight and more of a voice and we are included in the discussions uh, at places like the ipo which we might not be otherwise so hopefully we are um helping to to rectify that but yeah it's it, I mean, it's a difficulty certainly thanks yeah christy did you want to say anything about that uh, no no i i think it's i think it's been covered i mean i think one of the points yeah. of the people who are on that committee on that membership um you know one of one of the things that, that they'll be doing is thinking about how to influence their own organizations as well and the organizations that they're involved with in order to hopefully raise that profile within their um, institutions. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and Simon's just made a point about a, a particular licensing organization that are um, pressing the higher education and the further education sector at the moment, um, saying they need a license where we are fairly clear that we can what we can do is covered by exceptions. And I think that is a case where, you know, why it's really important to have that community. Um, but I, I just wonder, you know, whether there is anything that you think, um, Matt and Christy, as the chairs of LACA, is there, you know, we, we have, you know, a strong copyright community. We have people that meet, but I mean, what, what could we do? What more could we do um, to, to get involved or to help, you know, with the, the lobbying? Because I think, that feels like, um, you know, that as a community, that there, there must be something. <laughs> Is there? <laughs> Is there? Absolutely. I mean, so if you have concerns and you are having difficulties, let us know because it, it might be that this isn't on our radar and it is something we can help with. Um, equally, I mean, if there are consultations, um, you know, making sure you respond to those um, and that you are kind of aware that they are happening and that you are aware of the difficulties and the kind of impact that the consultation might have and you know if we can all be speaking with a similar voice raising similar concerns suddenly um, you know the IPO starts to listen because if everyone in the sector is saying the same thing it becomes much more apparent that, that that is a problem that is something that needs to be addressed whereas if it's just half a dozen institutions saying there are some problems it, it, it gets less weight and so you know being able to speak with a with it with a single voice and and being able to push back when you see anti-ai clauses in in publisher agreements and that kind of thing you know yeah. speaking with the same voice and, and and from the same hymn sheet does give us more more power and more weight and gives our our concerns more validity which in turn sort of empowers us to to make positive changes um yeah and, and i would say uh, make use of the exceptions anytime you can every time you can be really um strong on that because people get nervous or they get a little bit worried that maybe they haven't, they don't understand the exception fully or they're, they, they maybe do, but they're also just a little worried that, you know, they might end up doing something that, that could get them in, into trouble or that somebody, you know, it, or the, you know, they might be worried about, oh, well, you know, I'm being told this and this and this about the contract. I see this and this about, about the exception. I think coming together as a community can really help give people more confidence as well in using it. Cause the more we use those exceptions, the more we're promoting those exceptions, both within our organizations, but also as a group, see, you know, supporting ourselves in taking what is often a bit of a risk, actually, because the exceptions can be quite broad. And yes, maybe one day someone will will sue someone about something that they did. It, it doesn't really happen. So it's really hard to like we don't have a lot of precedent. Um, and so I think that kind of support is also really important. And I hope that LACA can kind of help with that by um that sharing and the that sort of um raising awareness and helping people to really feel more comfortable more confident doing that now i don't think we're very good at getting that information out necessarily ourselves but i do think that the way that we work with other organizations we do have some room for growth in that area and i think that is something we might be looking at in the future is 
how we actually help the community, um, not just our members, but doing more to help the broader community. Um, but I also look at like what you guys are doing here with the list copy seek and the, all, you know, you guys are doing some really, really amazing work around this already. Um, so it's also thinking about what we do in comparison to what is already going on. Um, and uh, I think that is something we need to think about a bit more is that confidence raising and making sure that as a sector, we are on the same page in terms of understanding the risks. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I think, I think that's a really, I think that's a really important point, actually. I think, you know, lack of working with some of the other organizations, we could probably do more. And I'm thinking of, you know, the, the, the CNAC, the UUK Copyright Negotiation mm -hmm. Advisory Committee that I sit on, um, like making sure that we are kind of keeping each other in touch with mm -hmm. things, but then also, you know, using the, the discussion lists and things that we've got and using webinars to, to kind of um, yeah, to, to give people more confidence in what they're doing. Because I think you're right, it's when people feel a bit like that they're going out on a limb and that they're going to be sort of targeted, that it makes yeah. this much more risk averse behaviour much more um, apparent. So, yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and using the exceptions and, and, you know, developing a kind of even practice there you know that starts to become best practice which in turn you know when everyone's doing the same thing that gives you some reassurance in the kind of gray areas of copyright and there are so many of those and that best practice kind of across the sector actually you know gives you a defense it, it gives you um, a confidence to use them and if everyone's doing that it you know it fills in those gray areas in in the way that we need them to be filled in so it's it's, yeah. it, it's just using them is, is a powerful thing Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've got a question coming from from John. Whether uh, does LACA have a plan to produce more briefings and statements? I mean, I, I I know you know as you said, you're all volunteers and you've all got day jobs as well. So I think that, yeah. that is a real challenge, isn't it? But yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we don't we don't we don't have any. Um, yeah, we 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 fit this in among uh, among everything else. Um, so we. Uh, yeah, we we try to do as much as we can in terms of public, I guess, outputs. Um, we're not, you know, we, we, we probably could do more. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think it's been great you've come on the webinar and actually, you know, if there's more that we can do, if you do ever want, you know, to get something out there or to kind of, you know, to, to return and come back and speak about a particular topic or if you need feedback yeah. on an issue from the sector what my sort of take away from this is that the more we can kind of join things up the the better mm -hmm. that that is so um i think i think that you yeah. know is kind of and, the and primary and reason why it was good to get you to come and talk to the yeah community absolutely as well. absolutely and we are actually we do like we've been we're working on our sort of finalizing what our focus is going to be going forward. And it will include a lot of those things that Matt mentioned um, in our presentation, but it's just um, coming, you know, it just takes a little bit of time for this, the committee to come together to final, to write up something like that, discuss what where our real focus really should be um, now, so, you know, in the situation that we're finding ourselves in. And I think AI coming in really strongly now as well um, and the text and data mining kind of, that's kind of shifted i'd say since you know pre-covid for example things have been happening so we're, we are looking at that and once we've kind of nailed that down it will be a bit easier for us as well to go okay these are the areas where we actually want to like be putting out our opinions on things and agreeing that in the committee so um yeah 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 All just, right. well, that's, yeah no matt sorry yes. i was just yeah. just gonna say just to, to echo what what christy said i mean we've got a a vast amount of expertise there but we don't have uh, a vast amount of kind of time and resource to, to create huge briefing papers, but certainly we'll be looking at putting out kind of more statements and more um, kind of short bits of advice and, and positions. Hmm. Hmm. No, that's 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 brilliant. That's really helpful to hear that. So thank you, um, Catherine. Any final questions from you? No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I just like to. Um, Thank you both, Matt and Christy, for coming along. As I say, I think it's been really helpful for the community to hear 
um, yeah. about the work that, that, yeah, thanks that so much. I do. Um, everyone will get the slides afterwards. Um, so we've got we've got your um, contact details as well. Um, I'm just going to pop my okay. slides back up as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, do it, it, do um, you know? I think the website is probably in need of a little bit of an update. I did share that, didn't I? But I think there hasn't been anything recent on the Lacquer website for a little while. Um, so if you if you want anything shared, please feel free to share things on List Copy Seek or or whatever. So, but thank you both. And I'll just put up your photos again. There we go. Thank you very much. And good luck with, you know, such an important work that you do lobbying for us all. So uh, in the midst of redesigning. Website. Sure. Yeah. Um, just to say um, that uh, if I could say coming up next, could you watch this space and bear with me um, while we try to get a schedule of webinars put together? If you've got ideas. Um, for webinars. We've talked a bit about accessibility today. I am sure you would all love to have a, a chat about um, the uh, uh, AI kind of issues that are coming up as well. A couple of other things that have just flagged up. So December is only just around the corner. So I'm hoping we'll be able to rope Catherine in to run our big fat copyright quiz of the year, which you were um, very heavily involved in Catherine last year. So that's just a a word of warning if you want to run away from me but hoping you might be able to get involved in that one um and um absolutely very soon um i'm hoping that uh chris i uh, um, and amanda uh, amanda wakarak who's at the university of alberta will be able to do a webinar to give you some findings from our copyright anxiety survey um, and focus groups that many of you took part in um and obviously, I think uh, controlled digital lending is probably a topic as well that we may well be returning to. Um, and as soon as I have slides from uh, Kyle's keynote at Ice Pops, I'll let people know. I think um, I'm handing over to Catherine for our one last thing, though. So just before we go, we always have a, a one last thing. And um, Catherine, you're becoming a bit of a, a copyright sort of uh, spotter aren't you looking out for it I know that's people. it's the it's the trouble with with being involved with this you you suddenly start noticing copyright issues everywhere um so one of the podcasts that I listen to apart from copyright waffle of course is uh <laughs> called the rest of Enter is entertainment uh it's got Richard Osman and Marina Hyde from the Guardian and they talk about issues around entertainment Every Thursday, they have a question and answers um, edition, and they had a question from Russell T. Davis, Mr. Doctor Who himself, asking why there was a credit for a typeface at the end of race or race. Uh, is it cr across the world or around the world race around the world, uh, which I personally love. Oh, in fact, it says it there. On the it screen. says race, race across, across the world, across but the I world. Call it yes. race around the world. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. it's racing. It's around the world. Yeah. yeah. Um, he had noticed that there was a uh, credit for the typeface uh, that they use in Race Across the World and was asking why it had to be uh, credited. Um, and obviously, as all of you can see, it's because it's a Creative Commons one that uh, requires a credit. Um, now, I'm a big fan of Richard Osman's quiz programs, not such a big fan of the books, uh, but, you know, uh, he let me down on this one. He called it the most boring question they've ever had on the on the podcast, <gasps> whereas, of course, we we would find it the most interesting one. Uh, but anyway, they did. Surely get it would have been an ideal opportunity to have an extensive discussion about Creative Commons and open licensing. I know. Well, obviously, with, you know, with uh, his many book sales, he's probably on the side of, uh, you know, mm. locking down copyright and making all the money out of it. But uh, oh. I will put a link into the particular episode. I think it's around about 15 minutes in if you want to have a little listen. And then they do come back to it the following week just to kind of follow up about uh, uh, this as well. Um, yeah, I was hoping it was going to, you know, kick off a huge discussion about Creative Commons. Yeah. But alas, yeah. Richard is uh, resistant to the the uh, 
the, the lure uh, of copyright. Maybe the lure, maybe that's it, the lure of copyright. The lure, so. maybe somehow we need to um, get the podcast um, under his nose, the Copyright Waffle podcast, Some, somehow. Yeah. That's, they're mixing up my metaphors <laughs> there, aren't I? You're putting a, a podcast under your nose. That's ridiculous. I'll, I'll stop at that point. Anyway, everybody, <laughs> thank you ever so much for joining us. Thank you, Catherine, for being my co-host. Thank you again to Matt and Christy for joining us. And um, we will see you again very soon. Watch this space for our next um, webinar. Thanks, everybody. And just stopping um, the recording.